Straight Shooting LJA here on behalf of Pitch Talk. Um, I'm here speaking to Mr. Howard Holmes, um, Director of Football Unites Racism Divides. Um, Howard, welcome to Pitch Talk. And first off, what is third? Hi there. Well, Football Unites Racism Divides, or as you said, third for short. Um, we're a, a community-based project in Sheffield. Um, that was set up in 1995 as a response to uh, racist harassment of, uh, of ethnic minorities in and around the Sheffield United ground. So that's how we started up as a response to uh, to that type of racist harassment. But we've grown into a, a, a really an educational stroke, youth work stroke, football project, right? So we, you know, we basically we try and. We try and use football in a very positive way as a, as a means of bringing people together and sharing something they both in, you know they enjoy, even though they might come from very different backgrounds. Oh, okay, that sounds that sounds really positive, um, especially the community kind of feel um, that you've gone for as well. So, in terms of community things, um, what do you do in particular? Um, is it just setting up events, or is it just all about bringing awareness to racism in football? We do all sorts, actually. We've got an educational section. We've got a teacher, stroke youth worker, who can go into schools and colleges and youth groups and prisons and so on to talk to uh, the people there about um, about racism in football using their interest in football in the first place and then widening that out to uh, you know other forms of sort of discrimination and within society and um, we've also got a big resources section and again got over a, over a thousand uh, materials that people can borrow all you need to do is go to our website uh, 3w's.third.org and then they'll see the, the stuff that we've got there it's all um, some of it's available directly online others you can order online um, we've got a uh, we have a volunteering scheme called uh, V here, uh, which in, you know gets young people to volunteer within the community. A lot of that is done with uh, our football coaching sessions. Many of those take place up at the Sheffield United Academy, uh, five days a week, um, either free or subsidised. Um, we've got a a mobile football game called Street Kick, which you can blow up in about five minutes. It's 15 meters by 10 meters, so you can put it up everywhere, anywhere really, with a flat surface, and uh, that can get the message over really quickly. We've took that around. Uh, we took it to the World Cup in uh, in Germany. Fortunately, we couldn't get it all the way down to South Africa because cost uh, prohibitive. We also went to the Euros in uh, Portugal in 2004 and uh, Austria. Switzerland two years ago and it's we're planning to take it to Poland and Ukraine so there's some of the things that we do oh, okay that sounds fantastic um, so you, it sounds like you're really getting around Europe um, are you looking to get around kind of worldwide to say America or Asia if possible well we have a lot you know we have more hits on our website from uh, America from the from the States based on anywhere else so you know, there's a lot of interest in what we do uh, abroad, and we've got some really good links um, in uh, in South Africa, particularly in, in Johannesburg and in Cape Town, with the District Six Museum in Cape Town, which um, hosted a, uh, an, well, still hosting actually, an exhibition of South African footballers in the UK called Offside, which um, people at Third uh, researched and wrote. Um, and uh, the people down in uh, in Cape Town, they they put the whole thing together. It's a fantastic exhibition. So, if any of your listeners get a chance to go to Cape Town over the next year or so, because it'll be there, it'll be there until next summer. Then, get down to District Six Museum. It's quite central. It's a brilliant museum as well. Oh, nice. Um, I know, I know, myself and the G Man would probably love to get out there. Um Maybe even, maybe even film some footage, bring some footage back, because um, it sounds like a really, really good initiative um, you guys have got going on out there. Yeah, it is. A, it's the, the 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 offside exhibition, as it's called. It's uh, again, you can see images of it on our website, but it's um, and you can borrow it. Actually, uh, we've got a we've got a a, um, a poster sort of sized uh, version of of it that is available free to. Uh, uh, to anyone to borrow, just pay. You basically just pay for the postage, and you can. There's 54 panels to it. They're A3 size laminated, so it's, you don't need a huge space. You just need you need quite a lot of velcro 
or blue tack to stick it up but otherwise um yeah again you can just uh, get in touch with us and borrow that oh cool that sounds fantastic um so the website is www.furd.org that's it oh, okay cool um so moving on in terms of topics um mm-hmm. Do you think that racism is still rife in football or is it just isolated incidents these days? Uh, it depends where you're talking about, right? If you, if you were talking about in, you know, in England and the UK, then much of the sort of um, uh, worst sort of racism that you used to have sort of in the 90s, you know, 15, 20 years ago, the sort of monkey chants, the sort of uh, vile sort of racist abuse sung by large numbers of people and so on. You know, famous, famous sort of incidents of throwing bananas on the pitch. John Barnes, in particular, had to face that. That type of thing in England, I think you, you could say, is pretty isolated. If anything like that was to happen, and if it, it did happen, I think there's enough people now in uh, the game. Uh, you know, supporters, uh, players, the officials of the club, the leagues, the associations, and so on. There's enough people now accept that uh, that it, it, it's wrong and that you you know it shouldn't be allowed and uh, would w- you know would um, I, I hope would you know would would be able between them to stamp things out now if you're talking about grassroots level then there are still incidents of, of racism happening at grassroots level uh, that don't get the same sort of publicity perhaps people just just don't you know uh, don't bother playing if they if they don't want to put up with it so Again, I think that's the job for the local leagues, for the county FAs to be vigilant about. And if you were talking about elsewhere, well, I'm afraid there are some there are some countries uh, in Europe, in particular, where um, you know where black players still get a pretty hard time. Yeah, um, I mean, personally, I think it's I think it's a real shame when it still kind of happens in Europe. Yeah, from what I see. And what the G-Man sees, um, it seems like England has come such a long way in terms of racism and even hooliganism. It looks like from England being the worst back in the 80s and the 70s, it almost looks like England have become the standard bearers in terms of um, racism and even hooliganism kind of stamping those things out. Um, Do you think that's a fair reflection? I do, but I think in, in, in both cases, in terms of racism and and uh, hooliganism, I think you really have to be on, on your guard, you know. I mean, um, there's, there's, there are some, there's some currents just bubbling under the surface, both in relation to violence and racism. You know, I think, I, unfortunately, I don't think um, our society is particularly less racist these days, right? But it may be that there's been a lot of um, progress made in football, but... You know, people leave the stadiums, then go back into their own towns and communities, and so on. And uh, you know, I think there's a lot of worrying evidence of people sort of turning against people who aren't like them and blame wanting to blame people from outside of England, for instance. Um, you know, for their for their situation. So um, you know, you really do need to be always on your guard. Um, okay, so if we boil it down to just England or even the United Kingdom let's just kind of broaden it out ever so slightly um, where do you think racism is at its worst firstly in the United Kingdom and then globally where do you think it's worst yeah well I wouldn't like to particularly point the finger at any any particular club or area within England right um, I think you know there's there's sort of good and bad examples everywhere I've, but I do think as I said earlier I think that particular attention needs to be played paid to sort of uh, grassroots football um, you know to see that some of the some of the changes that have happened in the professional game can uh, you know can also be carried through uh, on a Sunday morning in the park you know so that um, you know people um, you know aren't going to be subject to racist abuse and harassment or attacks and if they are that the full weight of the of the FA and uh, and the law if necessary comes down upon them um, yeah, I was actually going to ask you in terms of um, league sanctions such as docking points because I know from some of the biographical material that we got from www.furd.org we read out the FIFA rules and basically they play the free strikes and you're out rule whereby first you get three points then you get relegated and you get kicked out totally 
you think that grassroots level in terms of amateur and Sunday leagues, do you think um, they need to be a bit more heavy handed with their approach whereby instead of three strikes and you're out, it's, it's just one strike and you're finished? Um, I think everyone, I think everyone probably deserves a warning, right, in the first place, right. But um, I do think, I mean, the big, the big, the big advantage that you've got when you're talking about football and racism is that whether you're a fan who wants to go and watch a game, um, you know, whether you want to keep playing football. I mean, to take the, to take away the means by which you can do that, either by banning you from a stadium for racist abuse or banning you from a, you know, from taking part in, you know, suspending you for long periods of time for. Uh, stopping you playing on a Sunday, for instance, they're really big sanctions. You know, I mean, I, the worst thing that I'm a Sheffield United fan, right? For my for my sins, and uh, the worst the worst thing anybody could do to me would be to tell me I couldn't go and watch the team again. You know, so um, or and I'm sure when I was a young boy playing football, the worst thing anybody could have said to me is, right, you're banned for a year. So, you know, these they, they might not necessarily hit people in the pocket very hard, but they hit them in the heart. You know what I mean? So. That's, uh, that's where football really has got some effective sanctions, as long as it's prepared to use them. Oh, okay. I can totally understand that. I totally understand having them. It's all good having them, but it's just enforcement. Um, do you think there is still a long way to go in terms of racial equality for black and Asian players in football? Uh, well, I'm disturbed personally by the numbers of of uh, both black and Asian players. I mean, there's been a continuing issue about Asian players not breaking through. I've been in this uh, this sort of like line of work for about 15 years now, and you know, okay, we've had one or two achievements. Zesh Rahman broke through for a while. The nice playing in, um, if he can get in the team, he's playing in uh, you know in the second division with Bradford. Um, you know, I'm, I'm aware Michael Chopra's, I think, of a, one of his parents is Indian. He's he's done quite well. He's played in the Premier League and so on. But you know, it's not many, really, is it? I mean, there's plenty of there are plenty of Muslim players, for instance, playing in uh, in the uh, in the Premiership. So the old argument about that people used to use against well, Muslim uh, players were, you know, that they they. You know, all sorts of silly uh, excuses that managers I've heard in the past put up, like, well, you know, their diet's not correct, and they want they'd be they'd be fasting and not being able to play, or they'd want to go and pray in the corner of the room, and all this sort of rubbish. Um, you know, that's been proved wrong by the number of Muslim players that there are. I mean, you know, there are plenty. You only have to look at the names of some of the players in the Premier League. So, so that's not an excuse. And I'm worried also about the numbers of indigenous if you like black players from England uh, and the UK that are actually playing in the Premiership and in the higher leagues there's plenty of black players but they've not come through our communities like they did in the 1980s and 90s so that 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 worries me okay 